Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody again. We're going to get diving into Bible class this morning. I, I had uh, one, one, folk, one, someone may make a comment that maybe I could do a quick couple minutes on my, my week in St. Louis just to give a recap because it was a fun week. And um, so we, we joked last week a little bit that I was going to hopefully not come back with any broken limbs or bruises. And, and I, I think I've, I've survived. But um, in, all, in all seriousness, it was, it was a really good week. Um, got there on Monday uh, this past week and lots of different interactions with professors and there's uh, 15 other guys so 16 total 16 guys in the program with me and chances to meet them and hear a little bit about their stories and kind of ministry context that they're serving in and and you know personal stories for them about how the Lord's led them to, to serve in this way and um, we got to do things where I got to hear different uh, lectures and seminary you know kind of symposiums and seminars from a bunch of the professors on staff you know anything from talking about discipleship and the gospel of Mark to um, talking about addictive behaviors and how those things might manifest themselves. This was a doctor of psychology that's part of, on the staff and how those things might be important for pastoral care to uh, a whole number of different things. It, it, was, a, it was a really fun week um, and it kind of concluded on Friday. I was there Monday through Friday and it concluded on Friday with a great worship service where they were able to do um, kind of the placement, the official placement for me as, as, a, as a vicar serving here of faith. And I think there was even a picture on Facebook with some of those things as well. And and maybe the maybe the, the best part of the week, I was telling the, the Newtons over here briefly about it, um, but on Wednesday, they had they have all the different students, all campus students, so whether that's residential students, um, everybody else, uh, all the all the fa faculty, professors, everybody, we get to go out and do a server project. So there's, there's a bunch of these different community gardens kind of in downtown St. Louis, and they split us up into small groups of about 15 or 20 each, and you go to a community garden, you get on a school bus, and you go down there, and so I got to spend about three and a half hours uh, pulling weeds, you know, helping clean up this garden a little bit. Which is all really good, and and I don't mind doing it. But I also will say that while we were there, the the heat index was about 110. <laughs> so maybe it was a it was a good chance for me to sweat off a couple pounds and 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 <laughs> I, I was fine. I, it it was good. So 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 that was good. Um, before we get into Bible class two, I just wanted to make a quick announcement. Just given that Pastor Will isn't here, I talked about this before the service at eight o'clock. I'll talk about it before the service at 1032, um, just kind of an update on how Pastor Will is doing. Um, he's still sick, um, and he's just basically got some kind of nasty bug. Um, we don't know exactly what it is, but just some kind of nasty bug that's hit him really hard. And candidly, frankly, he, he ended up going into the hospital this past week and toward the end of the week. And, um, you know, I kind of look at this just quickly, think, thinking about it from the standpoint of I know when I'm home and I'm sick, I don't always do the best job of taking care of myself. I mean, I maybe don't always drink as many fluids as I'm supposed to or take medicine as often as I'm supposed to or whatever those things are. And so I'm really grateful, actually, not grateful that he's in the hospital, but grateful given that he's in the hospital, that he's going to have folks around him that are going to give him care that he needs, give him the things he needs, give him the constant care so that he can work on getting on the mend and getting better. And, and that's the sense I really have about what this looks like is something that he just needs to be there to get the care that he needs, get the treatment that he needs and, and work on getting on the mend. Um, it really, um, I'll, I'll say this again at, at the service too, but um, certainly he and his family are all asking for your prayers. And, and, and there's two, two things I want to say quick about how we think about this. One is which something we're not going to do. And the thing I don't want us to do is we are concerned about and we love our pastor and we love Pastor Will and, and we want to know what's going on is, is I don't want us to get in our heads in the way that the world might tell us to get in our heads, which is the the what does this mean or, or how is this going to you know the what if kind of scenarios about who's his doctor and what kind of treatments is he getting or or how long is he going to be in the hospital you know the, the litany of kind of questions that your brain could quickly go down of the somehow knowing more would help him get better and instead I really want us to think about what God tells us about those moments when we don't really know quite how things are going to go and in Philippians 4 um, Paul writes to us and talks about, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, take your prayers and requests to God, and God will give you the peace of mind that passes understanding. And then guard your minds and guard your hearts and minds in Lord Jesus. And so for that, that's, that's really for us. We've, we've got this chance that we can take things into prayer. And we know that the prayer will, will and can do things. God will hear us. God will answer us. And God knows exactly how he's taking care of Pastor Will. He knows exactly how he's taking care of each of us and every single day whatever it is, whether it's sickness or something else. So um, with that, let's, let's actually just do a quick word of prayer now, and then we'll dive into the Bible study for this morning. 
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we just uh, we thank you so much for the for the prayer, the gift of prayer that you've given us, for the fact that we know that 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 you you command us to pray to you, you command us to come to you, and we know that then you draw to us and you hear us and you answer us. Lord, Lord, we we come just with with prayer today for for our pastor, for Pastor Will, and for his family. Just we ask for healing, we ask for patience, we ask for peace, we ask that the the doctors and nurses that are in his care right now that that you'd use them as your instruments to to give him the the things that he needs. Um, Lord, Lord, we, we just ask for a little bit of peace too, the, the peace that only that you can give um, to know that, that that you've got your arms wrapped around him, that you're caring for him, you're caring for his family, that, you, that you're doing all things, all good things do come from you, Lord. Um, Lord, we finally just ask in every part of this that that you'd keep the devil far away from us, far away from this, far away from whatever it is that 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 we'd rest just sure and certain in the faith that you've given us, sure and certain in the peace that you've given us, sure and certain in the way that the Holy Spirit can work through us that we can offer up our prayers and supplications and that you will give us peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we're going to dive into um, kind of picking up. We have a, a couple slides left over from last week. For those of us that were here last week, we're, we're getting in, in our... Did you call them out for being confirmed today? Oh, not yet. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor Will. No, you, you're probably right. Um, I know, I would feel so bad. <laughs> Ryder, how are you doing? I, I, I know, I know. There's the spot that you get to come up and talk in front of church here at the late service. Are, are you ready cool. for that? Yeah. Do, do you want to yeah. do you want to give us the quick like? 45 second version about how excited you are that, that Ms. Barnhouse walked up behind you and gave you this chance to everybody kind of stare right at you a little bit too. Might be about three seconds. Uh, yay. Yay. <laughs> so this is exciting. Ryder is going to be confirmed in our late service today, which yay. is which is an awesome thing. So So what I want to do with this, uh, just I'm going to do kind of a quick recap of the slides we went through last week, just to kind of remind us a little bit about where we're at. And again, we're we're we're, we're basing this off this connect piece from last week uh, on the, the the story of Jesus with the woman at the well. Um, I'm not going to read the passage again, but we were talking about discipleship, kind of how do we walk with, with one another? Who do we connect with? We were thinking about discipleship. How do we walk with one another? Who do we connect with? We talked a little bit about who Jesus connects with, that he meets people where they're at, you know, that he's meeting a woman just coming up to get water at the well. Um, you know, we talked about some of the characteristics about the woman again, just thinking about the fact that in many different ways she was she was kind of an outcast of society, and that that's a common theme, obviously, for Jesus, whether he's meeting with tax collectors and different sinners and things like that, that he's he's willing to reach out to someone again where they're at, but someone maybe that someone would get overlooked in society. She was. She was an outcast in the sense of, you know, being a Samaritan. You know, Jews didn't typically talk to Samaritans. She was an outcast, maybe not an outcast, but at least seen as a lesser class as being a woman. Typically, one on one, a man wouldn't talk to a woman in this context. And then also, just given the fact that she'd been divorced many times, and that she was living with a man that wasn't her husband, just even within her in, in, within her own society, she was seen as kind of an outcast, which is why she was coming up to get water in the middle of the day at noon instead of in the morning in the cool of the day when most women would have been doing this. We talked a little bit just kind of about the women of the well that are in our lives, recognizing there's folks around us maybe that we don't always, um, it's, it's maybe easy to be a little bit prejudiced sometimes or have in our mind a little bit about, you know, someone that we might overlook or maybe somebody, somebody that we don't necessarily see as the same. And then I, I think somebody even made the comment too about sometimes even just as Nebraskans, or I might have joked, I guess, a little bit about the, the times that we say we're fine and, and <laughs> knowing that we're not always fine. Maybe there is really more to unpack there. And and so just really the, the ways that God does connect us with each other and connect uh, also those with, within our community. We talked about just, you know, Jesus beginning his interaction with connection with the women of the well and, and how this kind of might apply for us. The fact that he's really just talking about conversation. He asked for a drink. You know, I talked about the water cooler, kind of the idea that you're just at the water cooler. You're, you're in everyday normal kind of life, meet somebody where they're at. And it doesn't have to start with, do you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? It can start with, hey, can you grab me a drink? And he starts that to then sort of unpacks some a little bit more, beginning, beginning talking about metaphor, about who he is and the, the, the water that wells up to eternal life and, and, and pointing to him and then 
slowly digging deeper and deeper into that. We're going to get a little bit more kind of her response today. But when we're thinking about how Jesus connects, it's, it's really conversation that opens up doors. And uh, Vaughn told a really good story about this last week about somebody he was with in, in one of his vans and just kind of those opportunities and looking for those doors that God opens up those conversations that are then moments we can talk a little bit about our faith, talk a little bit about who Jesus is. How does Jesus reveal who he is to the Samaritan woman? Again, it was kind of in stages a little bit. Again, initially by metaphor and then, and then eventually more explicitly where he finally does say, you know, she talks about, I know the Messiah is to come. And he says that I am he that you're speaking with. So this is the piece then I want us to get into with Connect today to kind of finish up this piece a little bit of it is, is really thinking about how she responds. And I think this is an important piece for us to kind of unpack and talk through today when we're thinking about the, the, the folks that we have around us and, and as we're trying to connect with one another, maybe it's within the body of Christ here at Faith or it's within the body of Christ broadly, or it's folks that are, as we're walking in discipleship, folks that we might meet in a ride in a van or at a well, at a water cooler, whatever it happens to be, but kind of preparing our minds a little bit about how, how our folks gonna respond. And um, I've got up here, walk through the progression of responses in the, in the Samaritan woman, how is she responding to Jesus? And I've got three things to kind of think about. And then I want us all to kind of break into small little groups I'm going to give you a few minutes to kind of talk, and then we'll come back together again to answer these. But let's just, let's really think about what, what are her responses about water? Initially, they're talking about water. They're talking about getting a drink at the well. Kind of how is she responding about water? And what, what does sort of that tell us? And then you get into the discussion, that, the back and forth with Jesus. And, and he says, go get your husband and tell her to come back, and we'll get, get him to come back, and we'll talk. You know, what are those responses about the husband kind of tell her about, tell us about maybe how that can unpack for us when we're talking to someone? And then responses about theology. So with that, let's stop. You can obviously pull up your pull up in your Bibles um, if you need again. It's John four one through twenty six. If you want to pull it up as, as you're looking at this and in, in, in discussion groups a little bit. John four one through twenty six to pull that up. And I'll give you about I'll I'll give you about five minutes for this one just because this might take a minute to kind of walk through three different three different pieces. And I'll put the I'll put the pieces back up here in just a moment. Again, I'll I'll give you I'll be I'll give you just about five minutes. You know, turn to the folks around your neighbors close close to you if you can, huddle up a little bit, um, spend a little time kind of discussing this amongst yourselves, and we'll we'll come back together here in just a moment. I can't. That's what you're saying. You want me to come up, call you up here in a second? Then. I think that's yeah. I can't. No, it's quite all right. Thank you. <laughs> we'll just pass it to the writer. I'd like to write this one. <laughs> Since he's got all the news. If I could do what I do to write it to you. Right. I'm not helping you answer this question. 
What happened to your group? <laughs> I overslept this morning. That's all right. So <laughs> I've never done that. Never. I have. No, yeah. <laughs> Almost everybody has at one time or another. I remember the first week we were handing out those those discipleship bags that we did. That Sunday morning was one of those where, you know, and I knew I wanted to be here to make sure people were getting everything. And it was, I can't remember what time I woke up. It must have been like 7 20 or you know, something. It felt to be really late for getting here for eight o'clock. Thankfully, we only live about five blocks away, but that's good. It was one of those where I woke up and said, Oh my God, you know, just rushing through the house to get out the door. Yep. And I hate that. So, I mean, it happens. But. Well, it happens. It just happens. It's the way it is. It was kind of cloudy and uh, dark and everything this morning. So it was good going. God said, Hey, we'll give you a little extra sleep this morning, right? <laughs> How's the cake? I'm giving you you uh, one minute warning here to come back together here in about one minute. All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and start pulling us all back together um, and see kind of how we want to kind of walk through this a little bit. So let's let's kind of start first when I talk about responses about water. So that initial section, you know, about verses seven or so kind of in that and the, the back and forth when she asks for a drink and a little bit. What, what are kind of some of the ways that, you know, we're characterizing how she's responded to Jesus? Who wants to go first? Yeah. response of give me this water so I didn't even have to come here to draw the well from the well could have been responsive to um, her, shame. her shame so that you know she wouldn't have to come and do that and kill herself in, in the middle of the day. Just making sure everybody hears so Laura was saying that you know kind of a response of you know give me this water so I don't have to come back here every day and just think about her life circumstances that she's in shame and she has to come in come in the heat of the day. Maybe this is a chance that she wouldn't have to do that anymore. To help kind of take away that embarrassment, that shame, the fact that she has to has to operate that way given the, the culture and the society. Yeah. Who wants to go next? Everybody's quiet this morning. Harlan, yeah. Well, uh response about her husband, she says, I have no husband. Well, very true, yeah. She says the response about I have no husband. About it, you know, and about about the allergy, uh, she said, I know the Christ is coming. Yep. But she at that time didn't know it was Jesus she was talking to. Yeah. So he, he said response about the husband, obviously, I have no husband. And then the response about theology that she talked about knowing Christ is coming, but you know, not recognizing that that's who she was talking to there. Any other thoughts about water? For now. Um, 
<laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was joking with her over there that I that I should call on her, but you know. You're not supposed to talk to me because I'm scared to scare you. And then when it comes to the response about uh, the husband, she's very, it's very rule oriented, right? I have no husband because that's literally the rule right now that yep. she said that. And then the same thing that's about uh, the rules about where they should worship. And it's everything is very rule oriented. Until you, and then you get to theology, and she acknowledges, I know there's a Messiah Christ coming. Yeah. So, so, so Renell's talking about it from the standpoint of her being very rule oriented. Rules of, you're breaking rules here by talking to me as a Samaritan and a woman. Um, and you're breaking rules of, you know, rule oriented in the sense of acknowledging she doesn't have a husband. She's not following the rules in that way. Um, and, and kind of the, the progression there. And, that, and eventually, then even rule, rules about where they worship, whether it's on the mountain or whether it's the, the temple of Jerusalem. Couple of comments I was going to share, you know, just with the responses about water. First, first it's shock, it's surprise. It's the who are you a Jew that you're talking to me a Samaritan woman? This is the shock of how, what what in the world is happening. I normally I wouldn't even get talked to. And then the fact that he is talking to her about water, but it's again it's a way that she doesn't understand. It's a, it's a way she's she's still stuck thinking about her worldly needs. Even a little bit what Lori said about. Oh, if this is a way that I wouldn't have to come up here every week, every day for water, that would really help me out. Or maybe it's a, maybe it's a way that I just don't have to get water at all. I'm, I'm provided provided daily. This is my daily water need that I need. Um, but really, when when you even look at the metaphors that Jesus is talking about and the well of water that's springing up eternal life, he's talking about himself. He's talking about what he's going to provide, what he's giving, and how he's going to be providing faith through his death and resurrection of the cross. Steve. You know, the Lord brought to my attention how they feel um, myself and speaking for myself, my accomplishment and everything that I I have to confess in is because of the Lord and his gifts and his talent. It's not because of me. And we have a tendency to think it's because of us that we have these accomplishments. And it's not. Because the Lord has given us the gifts and the blessings to accomplish those things. Amen. We need to recognize that it's the Lord and then give us ourselves the credit the second, second. Amen. Steve's just talking about the fact of being reminded about how the Lord works through us and the gifts that he's given us. It's not about ourselves. It's not about the way that we think that we're good at whichever. As we kind of continue to walk through this, now I want to kind of move along because I say I'm, I'm talking too much, but... Um, <laughs> Because I want to wrap this up into thinking about how we look at discipleship in our own lives and how we look at the connection in our lives. When it gets into the responses about the husband, I want to think about if you're just out talking to somebody or somebody came up to you and said something as shocking as embarrassing, it would be to say, hey, go, 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 go get your husband. And then have to admit, oh, by the way, no, I, I've, I've, I've had five different husbands and the guy I'm living with now isn't even my husband. You know, and, and just the, the piercing way that that would come out especially in our culture and society, to have someone so directly confronting maybe what is the greatest sin in this woman's life. And, or, yeah, Lori, go ahead. And, and he was a perfect stranger. He knew nothing about her. She, she, from her perspective, yeah, yeah. From her perspective, he knew nothing about her. So for her to say, I have no husband, you know, that's, I mean, she didn't. You, you, you think it would just end there or it would, it would go in that direction? Not to have it flip all the way around to the other end of it. Yeah. He her. That's why she said, I perceive you as a prophet. Yeah. Well, and, and and another way to think about it, I think, too. So Jesus is pointing out one of her sins, but you look at the power structure in terms of what was going on in first century Palestine and who was actually responsible for being able to, to be able to enact the divorce. It would have been her husband each time divorcing her. She wouldn't have been able to divorce him. And so maybe in a sense, this is in my mind. You know, granted, she is living with the guy that she should be living with, so it is, there is sin here involved. But to think about her less as an adulteress, and maybe more as just someone that's really been hurt, hurt by the, a bunch of guys that had just treated her really poorly. And maybe in a sense, Jesus is also connecting with her biggest hurt of meeting her to say, 
you're shamed here because you're walking up at noon. Even the people in your own culture, your own society won't have anything to do with you. And I see that and I know that it hurts. Are we assuming all five husbands are still alive? Well, that'd be the other way. Is the husband's going to die too? I guess, yes. I guess yeah. the way the way you just pointed out, because I always thought they were dead. In my mind, so she was just. I, I, and the answer is I don't know. I'm just saying, if if, yeah. if it was divorce, it would have been the guys that did it to her, yep. not oh, the other yeah. way around. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And so then. I never thought of it that way. So that's... And so then, when we think about responses about theology, she talks about where do we worship. And obviously, if for, for those that you know, the Samaritans would have been worshiping up at, at, on a mountain where they thought that that's where the temple needed to be. And, and the Jews specifically, what are, what are the temple in Jerusalem? And the, the thing, the, the way that I thought about this a little bit, and you think about folks that we might be talking to in our society about Jesus, about whichever it happens to be, is how quickly it is for someone. So maybe it was her greatest hurt. Maybe it was her greatest sin. Maybe it was both of just getting confronted with the truth, some truth of the gospel. You got Jesus right there in front of you talking to you. How easy is it then to want to pivot? How easy is it want to push back and say, well, what about this? What about, what, what about this about your Lutheran doctrine that, that, that I don't understand, or maybe you don't understand? What about this to, to then argue about theology? Argue about theology so that it, it, it tries to push away the fact that maybe I'm a sinner. It pushes away maybe the fact that I don't understand the grace that you're showing me. Or it makes it about you instead of about me. And I, in my mind, I, I think that's a little bit maybe what's going on here. Carol. Well, for instance, uh, where I live, we've been in talks, and some of the churches people go to, they don't believe in infant baptism. And I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, And so it's kind of hard to understand that and to stand up, you know, because, for instance, folks. Baptist person, you know, it's pretty hard to talk to about that because she thinks like, and of course, I probably think I'm right. <laughs> so, so, so Carol's just kind of talking about, you know, the theology thing here is, you know, difficult for this woman because she's done it a certain way. Yep. Jesus is going to keep her in evil. Well, and so, so we can hear Carol's kind of talking about just the fact of. You know different denominations that maybe don't do infant baptism and you know that being a point maybe where you're trying to share the gospel or you're trying to talk about jesus and then, then you get stuck talking about should we baptize little kids or not you know that kind of thing um i saw a couple up i don't know who was first but adrian yeah I really like that. So somebody here, Adrian says she's looking at it cynical. Her response was cynical. Cynical about, you know, theology, cynical about religion, cynical about dogma, you know. Vaughn, I know you've had your hand up, yeah. The thing that struck me was that when Jesus said, you know, you know, you have five husbands and one you have now, it's a country husband. I was like really uncomfortable with her. So right away, let's switch gears and talk about something else. Okay, yeah. you're talking about like, how much we're supposed to know. Yeah. Get the focus off of me. Well, yeah, just get the focus off of me when you when you when you point out my issue with my husband's, etc. Who is next? I don't okay. Steve. You know, I what really grieves my heart, I've seen that in the community attitude is well, you know, our people that claim they love the Lord that have the attitude is well, Jesus died on the cross, he'll have mercy and forgiveness. I'm gonna do what I want to do anyway. I don't think that's why Jesus died on the cross, but to manipulate those immense mercy and grace and forgiveness that Jesus suffered a severe death and have that kind of attitude. I don't think God buys that. I, I, I agree. So, so Steve was just talking about the fact of somehow using the faith that we have, the knowledge we have, the joy that we have, but then flipping it around and using it more of as, I'm going to use the, the metaphor Steve is like a hammer you use against someone else to really push and not that you're pushing the gospel, he's talking more about kind of manipulating or trying to control someone else. And, and Steve, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of touch on it this way. If, if you, you look at Mark 8, and, and Jesus talks about denying yourselves and taking up your cross and following. And then later in Mark, in those, you know, couple, in those couple of chapters, he's really talking about the fact that you know, we're slave and servant to all because of the way that Christ was slave and servant to us, that our responsibility is when we're connecting with folks, are we willing to just put ourselves on the lowest of low 
this is the, this is the section of scripture when you eventually get into the pieces where he's talking about bring the little children unto me, the least of us, you know, and, and maybe it's children, specifically little kids, maybe it's just the least of us or whoever it is that can't help, can't help and can't take for themselves, like little children, that we're to, we're to serve others around us with the gospel, the good news that we have, connect with others around us in a way that we're treating everybody as if they can't take care of themselves. Steve. Uh, this, this mercy, but now walk without church saying we're in the sin, and that's why Jesus died on the cross and suffered his death. But I'm just saying the distinction and the attitude that I don't think a lot of priests are. Mm -hmm. You know, law not perfect, he died so we have a way for eternal life and forgiveness. But manipulation for Jesus on the cross, I don't think he looks too highly at that. Yep. So I'm going to keep us moving along. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, this is my last slide here for us for on Connect, and then we're going to move into Equip. But what does this all point to as we walk with one another in discipleship? And how do, how do, who do we connect with? How do we connect with them? And how do we expect them to respond? I think this all points to you know a bunch of different things. And I kind of tee this up and get into Equip is it points to the fact that over and over again through these conversations with Jesus, with the woman of the well, he, he continues to point back to himself. And he points back to himself in ways that maybe she doesn't really fully get, but it's what she needs. It's maybe in ways that make her feel uncomfortable, but it's what she needs. It's maybe, you know, and, and the thing that, that it kind of starts to ring true is that you look right after these readings and she runs back to town and she starts telling a whole bunch of people about who he is and a whole bunch more people come up and then that's, end up sitting listening to him talk about who he is. And you see that response of faith from her, even though she's admittedly here, maybe a little bit cynical, maybe a little bit misunderstood, you know, doesn't fully exist. And, and so I think for us, as, as we're talking to folks and we're connecting with folks, is it's, it's always about how are we drawing people back to who Jesus is? Who does he tell us who he is in his word? What is the grace and the forgiveness that we know that we have, the faith that we have because he's given it to us, to draw back to that? And, and I think that maybe, maybe sometimes can even help is not getting stuck talking about infant baptism, not that infant baptism is important, but to stay away from, from those things like, worshiping in the mountain or worshiping at the temple that might be a stumbling block, that really God's purposes for him bringing his son to die for us are much more secondary or tertiary compared to the fundamental thing we have about the grace, good news we have in Jesus Christ. And so for who we connect with, how we connect with them, and, and how do we expect them to respond of just thinking through that, that, that we should be connecting with whoever God puts in front of us to as he opens those doors. And that we can start in a way that's conversational, just about maybe where they're at, meeting them where they're at, Maybe it's in a way that we're connecting with them in, in, in aspects of, of trying to um, recognize that they're going to have different levels of understanding about what the what the God's word tells them. Maybe they have different levels of understanding what their faith is. Maybe they're really struggling with sin. Maybe they're really struggling with, with um, living a life secure in their sin where they're not really worried about what they're doing. Maybe they're, maybe they're in the spot where they're really beating themselves up about who they are. And as far as how they expect them to respond, again, that they may respond in a very worldly way. They may respond in a cynical way. They may respond in a way that you know, doesn't really understand what you're saying, but to, to just walk through all those things. And as you do, trusting that the Holy Spirit's working through you and know that um, in all those things, God's equipping you in a way that maybe you don't even see how they, it eventually makes sense. And even with where we stop in the reading today, we don't see that she gets it until after. And, and if you were the person, you know, obviously Jesus knew in this sense, but if you were at the well and told a woman all these different things, and then she walks away and you're like, well, she didn't get that at all. But evidently she did because she gets into town and she starts telling a whole bunch of people about all this stuff that she, this guy that she just talked to. And you may not see that. You may only see the part where it doesn't make sense and they're cynical. But know and trust that God through the Holy Spirit is planting seeds to, for that faith to grow. So I've, I've got 10 minutes to get through a clip. We'll see how that goes. So th this is the gospel that we have for this weekend. Again, with our, our, our selected readings. And the way that we're working through our vision series of connect, equip, and serve, and send. I think I've got it up here. I can get my phone to work. So this is uh, Luke, say Luke 10. Yeah, Luke 10, 38 to 42. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, 
which will not be taken away from her. So a couple questions up here to just kind of begin with as we think about this. What do you make of the, what do you make of the contrast between Mary and Martha's actions here? How they showed up. I mean, Jesus shows up to their house in Bethany. Um, they know him maybe decently well. We're not sure exactly well. I mean, eventually they, they become really close. But um, they're there, and, and obviously both of them react in the way of, here's Jesus. And, well, I mean, they know him well enough that, that they're calling him Lord. So how, how they're reacting, how they're responding. You, you've got the Lord Jesus in your house. How do you think you would respond? And what do we, what do we make kind of the contrast of those two? Here. Martha was going to make sure that Jesus had everything. You know, she was going to be a very good hostess. And she was going to make sure he was comfortable on everything. But Mary, she was going to take advantage of being with Jesus and learning all she could in addition to what she already knew, but she was going to make sure she got every uh, thing that Jesus could tell her while he was there. So yeah, they're, they're just for everybody here and talking about Martha, the fact that she was, she's thinking as a hostess, thinking about let's make sure that we can serve Jesus' needs as he's here in my house. What is the food he needs, the drink that he needs, making sure he's comfortable, place to stay, those kinds of things. Whereas Mar uh, Mary is thinking, I'm going to sit at his feet and take in whatever I can to hear from his words and hear his teachings as much as I can. Steve. I, I, like, I like this from a, a, a cultural standpoint. Because here you have two women, one with very traditional values. I got to be a hostess. I got to do all this. And then you have another woman who wants to learn. And, and in nowhere in the scripture is anyone telling them one's right and one's wrong. They're, they're both right in doing what they want to do. If she wants to be educated. Great. Go for it. And nobody's telling her not to accept it. Except for her sister, but nobody else is telling her she can't. And even Jesus is like, this is the best part, you know, and not shunning her for being a woman and trying to be educated, not shunning her for not doing what is traditionally and culturally acceptable either. So I, I, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. So I think everybody can hear a little bit, but just the, the, the contrast again of I'm just going to pick up on it because I know we don't have a lot of time. You know, it's two forms of service here in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's yeah. service. Oh, Kristen, do you want to talk? It doesn't matter what the man does. Go ahead. I think for me, the biggest thing is, is that so often we all can be like the Martha. We have this to do and this and this and this, and we're going about the tasks and things like that that we have in front of us. And we sometimes miss the opportunity to be able to, whether it's for ourselves to get into the word, or we miss the because we're so busy thinking about the things that we have to get done that we miss an opportunity to connect with somebody or we miss an opportunity to have a conversation with somebody that may not have anything to do necessarily with our Christian values or anything like that, but just an opportunity to form a connection because we're too focused on the task at hand. Yep, I definitely think that, and Vaughn will come to you in just a second, but and I even think it from the standpoint of as I read this and I think through this, when you look at when you look at Jesus' response here of the of the Martha, Martha, you're anxious about many things. It might be easy to think maybe he's admonishing her as if somehow what she was doing was wrong. And and I see it more as 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 a little bit of again Jesus demonstrating his empathy and his love of meeting her where she's at, and 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 she's really thinking about all the, the as Krista just said the, the the task and the list of all the stuff that I get to get done, and. He just, he's, in a sense, just saying, hey, it's okay to take a deep breath. It's okay to take a deep breath. He, Mary's just sitting here because she wants to listen to me. And, and I know you're, you're worried about all this stuff, and I, I know that you want her to be able to help you, but just take a deep breath. It's going to be okay because I'm here to serve you. He's here to serve us. Vaughn. Jennifer, I just want to say that uh, Martha is worried about the growth of her Yeah. So uh, just to paraphrase from Vaughn there, a little bit of worldly perspective of I got to make sure that I look good in my house and I'm taking good care of Jesus. And, and Mary's a little bit more focused just on, I want to hear what Jesus has to say. Uh, Bryce. Yeah, a couple things. I think Martha must be German because she's busy being a good guy. <laughs> 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 um, 
um, but I, I see her just being bitter. I'm doing all this stuff. She's sitting there taking in, you know, listening to the Lord instead of celebrating that I'm able to do these things so Mary can spend time with the feet of the Lord. Yeah. See, seeing the seeing the positive and how how is how is yeah. Who wants to, uh, Kathy? Well, it, you know, it says that Martha introduced him into her house. So did Martha and Mary live together, or was it Martha's house, and she would have been responsible for hosting Gary? My my sense of it is that. <laughs> My my sense of it that is that Martha was a woman of means, and I don't really know exactly how, you know, where, where she would have had those means. Um, and, and I've read that a little bit in commentaries in a couple of different spots. And so she she's at least in a spot where she's able to support Jesus' ministry in that way. And so she would have been focused about. The, I mean, it, in that sense, it makes sense that she's thinking, "Here's how God's called me in this vocation to help Jesus in His ministry." Well, it says her house. It doesn't say their house. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Carol. All I know. Carol, Carol, you know, just saying it twice, like, come on, come on, you know, just squeeze down a little bit. The, 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 take, take a deep breath. I, I'm right here. I've got you, and I know what you're doing, and, and I'm helping you do it. <laughs> Steve. You know, it's nothing wrong. God created each and every person here with different features and stuff like that just to enjoy God's creation and what he's created in nature, stuff like that. It doesn't matter if it's a male looking at another male or another female looking at another female and just admiring uh, the creation that God's created in that person. It doesn't mean they're immoral. It doesn't mean that she's immoral. It just means that you're enjoying the creation of that person. And society is so corrupt anymore that you look at somebody wrong or something like that and think, what's wrong with you? you are you immoral? And then you problems lead to problems and problems and problems. It's definitely true from a... they don't either understand or they don't have the wisdom of how the Holy Spirit or they don't, or they're lost. Yeah, and that what causes wars, divisions. Well, it's I mean, understanding. And and Steve's he, he's he's just describing a bunch of different ways that we see sin in the world, the worldly perspectives about how we should respond to different things. Um, I'm kind of just going to go through a few things because we're getting close on time. Um, when we think about the comparison contrast with Mary and Martha here too, um, and I, I I don't like the idea of being critical of Martha because I think she was trying to serve in the vocation that she was in, and you know. Christ is talking, Jesus is talking about the good portion. But the good portion I really see is more just in terms of how Jesus serves us. And Jesus serves us obviously with his death and resurrection of the cross that he's the word made flesh, he's our savior. But then he also serves us and he equips us really with his word. Mary was being equipped with his word. Even Martha was being equipped with the word of Jesus here in a way. Um, and in that sense here, I'm just gonna, there's only one thing that's needed in this world. And it must be placed ahead of all of the things, and that's the word of the gospel, that faith that we have in that word and salvation. So whether we're even in the midst of our lives and we're thinking about the lists and the tasks and the things we're trying to get done, Krista said it, but to remember to come back and draw into God's word. And how is that helping us inform the vocations that we're living in? Because he is the one equipping us for every good work. It says that in Ephesians 2.10. It says that in the Second Timothy uh, reading we'll have in worship today. In the epistle that Pastor Gary is going to preach on. Um, and when you look at Mary, she says she's, she's found the word of peace, which passes on her saying she's being trained unto eternal life. That good portion that she's getting, that good part that we get from Jesus serving us is something that's never going to be taken away from her. It's never going to be taken away from us. The faith that we have is something that Jesus gives us, and he continues to feed us. He continues to equip us as we read his word, as we hear his word preached and taught in worship services or in Bible study. He continues to equip us in the at the table with the body and blood of, of his his body and blood as he meets us with the forgiveness of sins. And, and again, thinking about the, the 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 line about the the things of this world are going to pass away, the worldly stuff, the list of things, the tasks that we have to do are all going to pass away, but the word of the Lord is never going to pass away. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave here. I know I'm already a couple minutes over, but. 
just a few scriptures kind of to, to kind of think about this in terms of God's word equipping us, Jesus equipping us, Jesus serving us, Jesus filling us, filling us and, and meeting us and giving us the things that we need in this life, including our faith. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So whatever ways that you're, that you're in God's word, you're reading God's word, you're hearing God's word preached and taught, it's not just this abstract idea. God's word is doing stuff to you. God's word is reading you and equipping you, maybe in ways that you don't even understand and don't even know. But God's equipping you for that next thing that he needs you to do. And that's a part of the how we walk together discipleship. Deuteronomy 8.3, 8, 8, man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Our very life that we have, the life that we look forward to in resurrection, comes from what Jesus has said and what Jesus has done. All scripture, this is the second Timothy verse that's going to be in our service today at 10.30. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So again, all scripture is going to be things that God's going to use us to equip us to be his little disciples, to be the servants, to be the slaves of those around us, to serve those little children in our lives, whether they're little, little, literal little children or other folks that just need to hear about who he is. So again, I just encourage us all today to continue to be in his word when you're in those moments, when you've got the task of life, the stuff of life, the things that seem really busy, like Martha was thinking, to remember to jot, take a moment to come back to see how is Jesus serving you and equipping you for that day, for that service, for that thing that you need to help get that task done, or to help take a deep breath and say, Martha, Martha, it's okay, I'm with you, I'm here and I'm serving you. All right, I'm over time. With that, let's get out of here. Let's go to worship here in a moment for those who are coming to 1030. Thank you.